So she was instrumental in retaining the position of market leader in Mumbai. And many of you may know that Mumbai as a city is a very, very, very huge city, which means that's a lot of work and sweat and time she put into it. Um, so essentially she believes in walking the talk. Additionally, she has created a highly dynamic work environment that facilitated innovation and continuous improvement by conveying the big picture as well as empowering teams to produce beyond expected results. She was awarded Woman in Red. Mm. You have to give her a round of applause. Woman in Red. By the group in 2016. And just because she made sure that whatever it is, the field of technology will be as diverse as possible. So my first speaker is Sarvasti, and please, when she comes and she holds her microphone, she'll tell you what her last name is. <laughs> Sarvasti, what's your last name, please? Oh, God. Oh, you don't have to stand up, please. Okay. After all these years. You've dedicated too many years to stand up. I, I think you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah I don't need it. No, we need, right. we need so it. The last name goes along. Yes. So, uh, so my last maiden name is Mata Chaji. It's a bit of a charge in it, you know? It's <laughs> okay. Say it one more time. Ladies, at the end of the show, or at the end of the program tonight, I'll ask you, we have a few, we have a, an, an iPhone 10 to give away. If you can pronounce that last time. Angela, you are warned. Okay, you may take a seat now. So that's you know? Um, I <laughs> you. Okay, so speaking about Agnes, wonderful lady, what hasn't she done under the sun? She is a highly successful business leader with strong commercial acumen and business flair. And you know what is beautiful about Agnes? She is what I call a silent killer. She will walk into a room, calm, collected, and then she will fire you. <laughs> but on a more serious note, she's what I honestly call soft power doesn't talk much. The words she expresses are powerful and deep. Now, as the marketing manager of then Millicom Ghana at the time, she led in designing and maintaining a consistent brand across all customer touch points. So this is to show you that Vodafone is not the first place that she's touched telecommunications. She's done it somewhere before, so she has a track record. But I guess even more exciting is the fact that she's also done it in another field altogether. She's done it in beverage, which shows, yes, she knows exactly what she's talking about. Whilst in Guinness, Ghana, she led in developing and executing a five-year strategy that resulted in a significant market share gain, grew net sales value in excess of, hmm, some hundred million pounds. <laughs> that is the impact she made. So please put your hands together for Agnes. Agnes, what's your title now at Dad? I prefer to say it this way so people understand what this is. Sales and Marketing Director, Consumer Business. Hmm. Another <laughs> item <laughs> All right. Let's go to my personal, personal, personal friend and this lady, I always say, how she can go head to head with the men cry. And at the time, when I worked with her, I didn't know anything about this women empowerment thing. I just thought, well, you know what? You make a decision about which field you want to go into, you hang on to it and eventually, hopefully you retire. But what she did is, rather than just hanging in there, she made a mark for herself. Patricia Obonai is currently the Director of Fixed Business and Customer Operations of Vodafone Ghana. She joined Vodafone in January 2011 um, and she came from being the Chief Technical Officer for Millicom Ghana Operators of... Yeah, I will not say it because we're talking about the red, um, but Operators of Tigo. Um, and she successfully transformed Vodafone Ghana's technology to the very best network and invoice and data for the past three years. I have never had to complain about my, my, my phone calls, and it's really all because of you. Not a man, but a woman. Please put your hands together for Patricia. <laughs> and finally, born in Ghana, educated and worked in the United Kingdom, before returning to Ghana in 2009. So I just said, oh, hi, are you Angela? Oh, I'm Angela. And you are. And you will hear her for yourself. She's currently Vodafone's, uh, Vodafone Ghana's Director for Enterprise and Wholesale, uh, the business arm of the company, with over 18 years of ICT and telecoms experience, both in UK and Ghana, and she's been able to drive innovation at the heart of Ghana's business communities to become number one business provider. A round of applause for that. Now, Angela has worked in very 
various roles, including head of sales for West Africa, CEO, business manager, and was the first female head of Vodafone Fixed Services. That's what I wanted to highlight. The first female head of Vodafone Fixed Services. Please put your hands together for the ever wonderful Angela Mensah Kokumuri. Okay, ladies, so just before I go on, I need you to fill these chairs because I've got cameras and I want everybody to know that we were oversubscribed. We had to turn people away. <laughs> Lovely. And remember, it's an interactive session. Um, for the next 30 minutes, please feel free to stop and ask any questions you want. This is not a classroom at all. It's really meant for you to absorb the easiest way possible on a weekday night. Um, so I'll go straight to you, um, Agnes. Given the fact that, at least with what I read, sorry, with what I read from your um, from your bio, I'm going to close my eyes and and uh, imagine that every single role must have been surrounded by men. Um, what kind of decisions did you have to make in order to persevere in all these wonderful roles? So, um, yes, I think you know. Hello? Hello? Okay. So, one of the key things for me when I joined Guinness Ghana Breweries, obviously it was very, very male dominated, you know, beverage company. Um, there were only two of us in the macro at the time, we were, you know, say females. But I think the decision I took at the time was that I really wanted to work to get to the top. I wanted to leave that place as marketing director. And therefore, I went over and above and beyond. A lot of sacrifice, late nights, hanging out with the guys, going into the bars and everywhere that we needed to be. And not complaining. Because for me, I think that the most important thing is that you shouldn't let your gender stop you. Whether you are, you know, whatever it is, as long as you are in the midst of uh, uh, men, you need to ensure that you prove your mettle and that whatever, whatever you're contributing makes a lot of sense. So you have to go hard work and preparation in everything that you're doing. And don't worry about the fact that you are amongst just men because whatever they can do, we all have the God-given ability. So. I think that's very important, not to worry about whether you are good enough or not. Just go for it. That's fantastic. Um, Srebasti, you know in Ghana, um, we always have the issue of culture and tradition. And it on honestly is such a broken record. Um, in, a, in a city, let me just focus on the city of Mumbai. In a city of Mumbai, how were you able to respect the culture, love the tradition, but also kind of show that you are a woman in red, you are powerful and not really a threat? To okay, so so Mumbai, for those who know about it, is a, a, a cosmopolitan city and it has got no culture barrier as such. So, um, frankly speaking, uh, you missed out on one part of my life, which was I served Indian Army. So, when I served Indian Army, uh, there you meet men and men at very, you know, what do you call it, culturally whole India is very big, so you get people from all part of India and so you handle those people. As such, in Mumbai, being the first uh, CTO of um, India, first technology director of India, so it was it was a kind of um, uh, tough decision for the management also to award me that, that role. But best part was that uh, I never asked myself to be seen as a female. You know, so that's so first and foremost, I never asked myself to be seen as a female, and I'm a born soldier, so so it's been a fight which has been going on. So, so I don't think uh, you meet those cultural requirements and cultural challenges. I think I've watched with the Ghanaian culture now, it's five, six months, and I I can accept few things, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like this place and I, I've adopted uh, to this culture as well. So, um, it's been a long journey of cultural differences, and I've managed to handle it. That is so beautiful to say, talking about soldiering on, not just in its literal terms, but also in its figurative terms, you know, that you have to learn how to kind of keep it going and soldier on. Talking about soldiering, Patricia, you've got to tell me what it must have been like or what it was like um, walking into a field that was clearly, in a layman's term, about connecting the wires. 
Were you the only female at the time, or one of you? Yes, I was. I had um, a colleague who joined just for internship, and then she left. So eventually, I was the only one left with her, with all the guys. I think the one important thing was that although some of them didn't have their degrees, they had the experience. So for me, one of the important things was to show them the respect. If you really want to lead people, you have to learn to respect them. And more especially Ghanaian men who have their egos. Okay. So giving them that respect and being humble enough to say, I'm from school, I'm here to learn. I'm not saying I want to be your boss, but I certainly want to know everything you know. Give them the room to open up and explain everything they were doing. It's such a fast moving industry. Um, I started from analog into 2G to 3G to data to fiber to all the things. So it's not an industry where you can afford to stay in school until you can learn everything. It's such a fast paced industry that you have to learn on the job. You have to read whilst you are, you are going through it. And that's how I managed. So through on the job experience with the team I met, reading quick, fast paced, Google searching stuff. That's the best way to, to go through such a thing. How many of you are in school? What are you studying? Journalism and mass communication. Okay. My people, so. <laughs> All right. No, but talking about education, um, um, Angela, coming to you, did you feel the pressure to make sure that your education at least put you at par with, I guess, your male counterparts? Um, I think to, and you can tell I'm very British, so. <laughs> I think that um, to touch on what all the ladies have mentioned is, I didn't really acknowledge being a female in a male environment. It, it was never instilled in me. And I'm really fortunate to have amazing parents. And my dad, strangely enough, always pushed to make sure that we understood we should dream big. So I was always brought up as you can do anything. So when I went into telco, I didn't really think about um, I didn't really think about gender. So I was always pushed to be the best I could be. And honestly, that is the most important thing. So I did my master's, I did my undergraduate degree. I am constantly learning. I did my Google Squared course. The thing is, is about you having hunger to be as good as you can be and learn as much as you can. And bottom line is, whether you're a male, female, just as long as you're great, exceptional, and passionate about what you do, it doesn't really matter. That it's a leveler. You know, education is a leveler. Take it seriously. Make sure you continue to learn. And look, we all have Ghanaian parents. There is no way that I was dropping out of school and becoming a dancer or anything. I would be kicked yeah. out so education is important but that constant drive to learn more understand more is something that never leaves you so the gender thing is there but honestly just as long as you're brilliant about what you do i think that it's a really great leveler you know, it's funny, Angela talks about, you know, family and honestly, well, obviously how family is supported. But Sir Basti, because you probably have more years experience across so many fields than all of us combined, what was the role of your family? Did they play any role in any key decision that you had to make? Frankly speaking, without their support and their a bit of contributing to the entire journey, no one, none of us can actually actually take the journeys which I have taken. I've always worked into Mail Bastion, be it joining the uh, the broadcasting unit and then joining Indian Army and then joining uh, Vodafone and now coming all the way to Ghana. So these all decisions have been uh, 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 my decision supported by the family and uh, throughout the journey. When you are not married, it's been uh, the parents who, even if they didn't like me uh, going into the army, the forces, uh, they 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 felt proud about it. When I, you get married, then your my husband has been, I won't say um, 
uh, contributed, but he's been supporting in not interfering. You know, that's also a kind of support. It, it's like, supporting, okay, you have a career, okay, you want to do this, okay, right. But then, yes, there are decisions which I have taken, there are sacrifices which I have done, but without family, it's not possible. Without family support, it's not possible at all. And, and, and there are um, moments where, where you feel that, wish they were more contributed. But yes, there are many decisions which you take on your own. But till the time support is there, I think it's it's good enough. And, and, and Agnes, what would you then talk about, you know, obviously there comes the issue of the husband. I mean, we're all young ladies uh, getting older by the by the day. How many of you young ladies are married? Okay, how many of you have born and married? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you hold, I, how many of you are like, I like, tend to be actually. Yes, pop in the question. <laughs> None of you? <laughs> oh, some, yeah, in the back, don't worry. Yeah, I'm coming to you before they come and say. Um, but but I mean, when, it, when it comes to the decision of then you've got to blend the, the, the domestic with the professional, do you really, um, does it really become a very difficult decision to make because you've had this other person in your life when it comes to your career? Um, I think. First of all, it's important to be upfront um, with your partner. Um, even as young ladies, when you're thinking of dating somebody, you need to be upfront. So in my case, for example, I think my husband, right from the time we were dating, knew that I was one ambitious person. I wasn't going to sit at home and just cook my meals. I was going to go for my dreams. So if you're happy to come along with somebody like me, then fine, we're going to have fun about it. And I think that's very important because, uh, and with that mindset, because there have been very tough decisions. I've had to leave the country to go and work in another country for three years. And because we had already had the built that um, understanding, when the opportunity came, he had to stop everything and come along. Um, it was a big sacrifice, but I also knew that when the time came to do that for him, I would do that. So I think right from the beginning, you need to be able to look for secure people, a partner who is secure, who is confident in himself, so that when you want to go after your dreams, it's not going to feel threatened. Um, and I know that sometimes when you're young, it's very difficult to find the right balance. But you need to, at this age, most of you have finished school and so on, you need to know yourself and what you want and don't make any compromise. Make sure that whoever you're working with understands that you have big dreams. The word is balance, work-life balance. A lot of young women, myself included, I'm, I'm also terrible with it tend to forget that there are two parts to life. There is the not so serious part where you relax and then the other part where you commit. Patricia, tell me about work-life balance and the reality of it. Be frank, be honest. Uh, don't, don't, don't give me uh, uh, the technique. Be honest about how easy or difficult work-life balance is and so what we must be prepared for. No. <clears throat> When you are starting the career, it doesn't exist. Especially because you want to find space for yourself. So I had to give up a lot of the travel opportunities that people were taking when we were in the universities because I had to do my internship and find an easy way to get through my national service and find a company to work with. So you have to make that sacrifice at a point. You also have to decide that even when you start working, People are staying in the office to deliver their reports. Do you say it's your time? So you want, I had the boss who had his morning meeting Monday, 9, 8 a.m. But he wanted the report updated up to what happened on the network on Sunday. So what was I supposed to do? Tell him Sunday is my weekend so he had to have the report and he has to wait in the office. No, after church, I showed up in the office and got him the report. It took something out of me. But at the end, it helped me. It puts me in the right place to be considered for that next job. So it's so important to understand that you have to make sacrifices along the way. But when you get to a certain point, you can learn from my experiences. Don't give up when it's time to get married. Please, there's no point deferring it. Don't give up when it's time to have babies. There's no point deferring it. Because you have made all the sacrifices up to that point, people will, people will be okay that you are away for three months to take care of your baby. Don't live with the feeling that I have to leave, I have to run back to the office with your breasts, with all the milk and everything. You, know, you, you need to pay the price 
when you have the time. And this is when you are young, pay that price. And so when it is time to take that break and ask the permission because you have a menstrual crumb, your boss will understand. The person will even call you in the house and say, oh, where are you? We didn't see in the office. You say, okay, I have a tummy ache. You can't say what it is, right? So I have a tummy ache. It's like, oh, no, we wanted to discuss this with you. Even when you're in the house, they look for you. Because you know when you are present, you make the sacrifice. And that's why you can have the balance at a point because you have paid the price and therefore when it's Saturday and you are not available everybody knows that on Monday you will deliver that's beautiful so what I'm going to take out of that is that there's a time to focus on one thing there's another time to focus on another and then when you're paid your dues in a way there's a time when you can actually have both Angela tell me about decisions on having both do you stop and say okay where does the both start um, because the world is moving so quickly, I always say we're in Ghana, but we're competing with India now because of social media, because of the internet. At which, at which point in time do you accelerate? And at which point in time do you park and chill and check your makeup? <laughs> um, I think that's a really good question. I think it's personal to everybody. I really do think it's personal to everybody. Um, Look, we're amongst friends, so I'm gonna keep it real. I'm 38, I'm not married, I have a partner, and I don't have any kids. I know you're in the back thinking, 38, she looks good for 38. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, and it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't deliberate. And I was saying to the girls upstairs, I love my life. I love my life, right? At a drop of a hat, I can go to SA or the UK and I'm not looking for someone I'm no disrespect. Um, <laughs> looking for someone to look after the kids. I love my life. However, I am also looking at the biological clock and thinking, do I need to freeze my eggs? <laughs> what am I doing? You know, because you do think about it's that when you get older. Yes. That's the truth. And so you have to make the decision for you and don't let other people push you into that decision. Because what I see is, especially in Ghana, the first question is, oh, okay, so what did you graduate in? When are you getting married? It's like, okay. The key thing is, is don't rush, find the right person. Because all the things that you said around maturity, and boys do mature later than women someone that is going to be rooting for you when you have to stay in the office and work on the weekends they're not bitching and moaning about those things it takes time and it takes compromise and it takes maturity and you don't always find that in your first go like i don't know about you but i didn't marry clearly my first boyfriend we would have been the rules by now. So my point is, is that do what's right for you. And I, I believe very strongly in work hard, play hard. Work hard, play hard. You have to work. So if I have to come in after church or work until 9, 10, come in at 6 a.m., I will do it. I will also ease off. And even at work, I make sure that I have fun. Because you find yourself spending a lot of time at work and work becomes your life if you're not careful. And you have to be conscious of that, especially when you're young. Because you don't have the kids, you don't have the bae, or you might have the bae, you don't have the husband. You don't have those things stopping you. And so you can be very, very focused. And before you know it, you're in your 30s and you're thinking, Okay, what happened? Just be conscious of that, but I do genuinely believe, and I'm very passionate about it, is that it's your decision. It's your choice. Don't let people force you into society says. But also understand you've got a biological clock, so that is something you have to keep on remembering. <laughs> that is unfortunately and the it's, it's, it's so funny how you say that because Honestly, I remember falling pregnant without thinking that I was going to fall pregnant and being at that point where I wanted to do what Patricia was saying, commit my everything to work. I wanted to do everything about work. I didn't make a decision to fall pregnant. You know, you guys know about that. <laughs> um, but I understand.
understand where you're coming from, but the funny thing about society sometimes is just when you've accepted that this decision is for me, there's also a way society makes you think, maybe you didn't make that right decision. Shabasi, have you ever encountered that? I mean, you you are sure. Multiple times. <laughs> Multiple times. Yes. And how do you deal with it? You know this is for you. You know it is you my life. You know what? It really doesn't matter. Mm. Because um, this work, you, you have chosen it. The life, you have chosen it. The job, you have chosen it. I do whatever, whichever part of life I'm living, I do it with full passion. So uh, when uh, um, they are, you know, why did uh, she join the army? Why did she go abroad? Why, why I, Ghana? They're all the stuff. So I'm so, asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 because the choice of my movement was either Ghana or Italy. So, you know how people think like huh? <laughs> so, so I have been doing stuff which people have been to, telling me not to do mm -hmm. so that's there from the childhood it's a curiosity come I don't know maybe it is uh, good kind of so, yeah so so it's, it's just that uh, these questions have come in every stage in my life that she's the third uh, child uh, daughter in the family so what will happen she's dark what will happen so there have been questions about everything and anything so I really I, and it's been like the grooming the values which our parents have inculcated in us I think that has been a strength you know a strength that you are no less than anyone you can take your own decision I think that part has been seeded in us and, and uh, my mother still says that uh, you ha are emotional. I said it's it's there's no uh, harm in being emotional, you know about it. So if if say for example society is against me or you know they are saying that why you are doing so I I will cry but then I will go back and do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. So crying is really okay. It's absolutely okay. How many of you ladies like to cry? <laughs> I mean, you just see me yesterday, I see my answer, I don't think I can do this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a client's website to load, it wasn't working, I was like, I can't do it. So this morning he said, hey, hey, honey, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh at me. Uh, uh, um, but Agnes, not being able to do something, particularly where, where and when the world is talking about gender equality, do you find yourself under pressure now more than ever to prove that you are capable of doing everything? Mm. That's a very interesting uh, mm. question. Um, in terms of focusing on doing what has to be done, I've learned over time that I don't have to do everything. So, and I'll relate it to my life in general. So I've learned to delegate um, I think you need a tribe of people to support you in your life journey. And you need to have those people that you can call on. So obviously, yes, at work I want to put my everything in because there are seasons in life. But then I ensure that, I mean, taking care of my family, my son, uh, whether it's uh, food and whatever, it's, I have to find ways and not be everything all the time to everybody. Because I also believe that if you don't fill yourself, you really can't give out. And it's important to ensure that your emotional, physical being is well taken care of, which you can't delegate, because you have to take care of yourself, so that you can then be an outpouring out there for whatever you want to do at different phases in your life. Lovely. So don't try and think that you are a superwoman. No. You're a human you first. Yeah. You take care of the human. Um, I'm going to do a last uh, round of questions. So ladies, then I'm going to throw it to you to ask uh, our panel whatever <laughs> questions are on your mind. Don't hold back and stop pretending you're perfect because you're not. Um, Patricia, being surrounded, being surrounded by people, what kinds of people have you chosen to be surrounded by to be this successful? People who, who will make impact on my life. So. My family always tells me my sisters are my friends, and that's true, even my friends say that as well. Because you want people who will say it as it is, and not just um, want to be nice to remain your friends. And my sisters tell me off, we are four girls, and they say it as it is. I married somebody who understood my work, that's my husband, he's an engineer as well. So he understands when I have to work late, he understands when it's not working, even before we got married, he was 
sitting by me on those Sundays to do the reports anyway. So when I have to stay in after we are married, it's not you. So you always, and if, if I look at all the friends I have, most of them are very old, like older than me, because somebody has to say something to me so I can also impact somebody. Um, and and that's, that's how my life has been. All my friends are much older than me, senior men in government or in business or if, I'm not a CEO, but I find I have a lot of CEO friends because I want to learn from them. That's that's not what I do. And that's what life should be, always aspiring to be something and making sure that the person next to you is more than you. But in an era where we have egos and we're concerned that the lady sitting next to us could very well become um, more influential, more powerful, should I share everything? Because maybe when it comes to deciding who is going to be CEO and they want to make a woman, they may choose her because I've shared. Does this make sense to any of you? And if it, whether it does or it doesn't, what should our mentality <laughs> truly be? Shabasi, I'll start with you because you're eyeballing me right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. That's, what, that's what exactly much. what I do. So you know what? Uh, being surrounded by people who are better than you is for you to learn from them and to get guidance. It's not because they are CEOs or uh, anything of that sort. So yes, ego comes in. And I think at times we manage it with humor or manage it with uh, certain compromises you do in the way you present yourself. You need, should not be overbearing also. So uh, so it's, it's just that um, it's a very interesting uh, kind of blend and kind of uh, you know, uh, environment which gets created when you are too many high potential people in one room. Mm. You know, then, then it's like, look at me, look at me, look at me, everything they say, look at me. <laughs> and then you at times need to if you really want to, it, it all depends upon what you want to do. Do you want to overpower them? Then you overpower them with something else. If you want to be with them, then you uh, you you use a different tactics. So it's it's a it's a kind of what it's a, if it's friend actually these all things doesn't really matter. Friends are beyond ego. Friends are beyond hierarchy, and friends are of course beyond uh, you know looking at them and saying what kind of tactics should I adopt. Uh, and guys having friends and professional friends is a must you need to have actually it says that any organization is the best organization if you have a best friend in the organization you know that's that's very much needed so i've been lucky that i have been having uh, best friends here i'm not saying <laughs> but then, yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun. because it's like it's like complimentary you know yeah. if you are missing out on something then the other person is pointing out you're going down you know? so it's a journey actually, it's a journey. It's a beautiful journey. Yeah. And coming into my last round of questions, I'm going to ask each one of you ladies the same questions. Um, what would be your three keys to success? Same question to each of you. Your three keys to success. Mm -hmm. it okay. uh, for me, uh, three key things which has been uh, Helping me is my curiosity. Yeah, remain curious. Remain, you know, what exactly? Why is she having that kind of? You know, I keep on bothering her about why she's having that kind of hairstyle. And I understood the entire stuff. So the curiosity. Second, of course, which has helped me is being creative. It uh, somehow get that creative. Uh, bent of yourself which will make you innovative which will make you uh, different uh, thinking and third has been daring so uh, be daring be sincerely daring whatever you do dare and, and uh, then stick to it stick to it that you can do it never 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 even underestimate yourself Angela um, I think for me and maybe this doesn't count to my three but always be brilliant at what you do that goes without saying all the rest of the fluff the hair the nails the sh it means nothing if you are not brilliant at what you do so hone your craft and be brilliant at what you do so that's a given so that's not in my three um be authentic be exactly who you are be exactly who you are as you mature in the career ladder, you'll realize that you might have to 
oscillate who you are. So bring 100% of who you are to work. I'm a extrovert slash introvert. I bring that to work. Listen, my friends will tell you who I am and these guys will tell you who I am and it's the same. However, you have to be able to oscillate your style in various scenarios. I'm not saying I always do it. I'm giving you my <laughs> advice. Um, run towards the fire. And what I mean by that is, when people are saying, no, I don't want to do that, or when you're a bit scared about doing stuff, do it. Do it, because that's the only way you grow. You, the, the days of textbook learning have really gone. You have to throw yourself into the fire. So when your boss is saying, please come, please come in on Saturday, and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to. It's that person that steps up that gets remembered. It's that person that steps up, that stretches themselves. So run towards the fire. And because the last one didn't count, um, the final one, the final one is you can't do it by yourself, right? As wonderful as you are, and in your 20s, you think you're awesome. Like you really, even in your thirties, you think you're awesome, right? Even forties. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, but you realise that you don't get where you are on this journey without having amazing people behind you. And we've talked about the personal life and the bay and the husband and the sisters and stuff. But if you've noticed, right? I'm sitting next to three other amazing. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, kick-ass women. There are two others, right? Our CEO and our HR director. We all sit around the boardroom. We fight, we argue, we, we, we are conciliatory, we drive, we're passionate, but there isn't, there isn't a better feeling than having this level, this standard around you. Surround yourself with amazing people because it will make you amazing outside of your husband and your personal life always make sure that you and i'm sure your parents have told you be careful who your friends are i'm very fortunate that i sit around the table with these women and i include myself in that by the way so i'm not just looking at them saying they're amazing me too i'm amazing as well right <laughs> so that i think is also very very important <laughs> That's fine. Oh, that's fine. Because you're amazing. It's great. It's amazing. Yeah. It's all. Yeah. So why not? Um, yeah. I mean, as I did mention one or two things that I'm sure the others also share as well. Um, I think for me, the first one I also start from is surround yourself with people who are better than you, so you can learn from them, and don't. Be, don't be, feel threatened, because that is very important. It's the only way you can reach for something better. The second thing is that you need to be patient enough to get tenure. What I mean by tenure is that I, I call some of the young generation fried rice generation. You want everything you want it now. You are not prepared to go through the sweat of becoming an expert in the field in which you choose. You have to take the time to become an expert in the field in which you choose. And the third thing is that never think you have arrived. Never ever. You have to keep learning until the day we all go into that six feet down the ground. You can't stop learning because the world is moving very fast. Things are changing and you should never think you have arrived because when you think you have arrived, there's somebody else there who has probably more arrived than you. Never stop learning. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I have relied a lot on the God factor. So I'm a Christian and it gives me enough hope and confidence to come to work knowing if I feel somebody has my back and he will prompt me. So that has really helped me. The second one is that all the areas in which I have operated have been rough and tough and you still have to remain calm and confident in the way you are pushing. So that helps me to think. So I, I prefer to, in all the, the turmoil, to remain calm and exhume confidence even if the situation is bad and that really helps me. 
And the last one is that I am not afraid to ask questions, no matter how stupid it is. And even after today, I still ask questions in the boardroom when they present and I don't get it. And that's how I have learned. You, it's okay to know because these things are not taught in school. So feel okay to ask because you gain the knowledge and you become a better person. Most beautiful things I have ever heard. In all honesty, freshness, transparency, and honesty. Did I say honesty twice? Well, you've got to be honest to learn a few things and to share a few things. So I'm throwing the uh, invisible mic to the audience, to you, ladies. Please feel free to ask the dumbest questions because you'll get the most powerful answers. We have approximately 10, 12 minutes to round it up and, and be here. So who's going to be my first? Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, you. All right. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. That's what I want to say. Thank you. I'm truly inspired, and I never really walk away from sessions like this saying I'm inspired. Um. Okay. Everybody says keep your focus, keep focus, know your plan, know where you want to go. But I'm probably one of my biggest distractions. Once I'm focused, something distracts me. How have you guys maintained either not distracting yourselves or actually keeping focus? Mm -hmm. Wow. Any one of you can take that question. Come on. Yeah. I don't know why you said it to me. Is it because I'm easily distracted? <laughs> um, look, it's good to have a plan, but be flexible. Yes. Because if I tell you, I remember when I left university, well, I wanted to be a dancer, and then I wanted to be a basketball player when I was a lot younger. Then I wanted to be a politician, and then I fell in love with telco, and I stayed in telco. And despite being in telco, I've done over six different jobs. I get bored really, really easily. I genuinely believe there is nothing wrong with not knowing what you want to do, right? I think it's important to identify your opportunities to take them, right? Because if you had asked me at 21, do I want to be director of EB? No, I don't. That's not glamorous. Why am I doing that? No. And even some of the decisions I took to get to where I am, they happened to me. I was fortunate. People created opportunities for me, and they weren't in my plan. Going into fixed services, and I'll say that, hey Patricia, you don't mind. Patricia was the one that said, oh Angela, you leave your little cushy sales job and come and manage the engineers. I didn't understand what she was talking about. And in fact, I thought I was being punished. And I say this all the time. I went away and I cried and I cried and I cried because I thought I wasn't doing a good job. Why would you leave me? But she saw something that I didn't see. And if I hadn't taken that move, I wouldn't be where I am today. I say that every single time. I wouldn't have, because it taught me so much. But it wasn't in my plan. It wasn't in my plan. So just as long as you know what you're going to get out of the experience, I think it's okay not to be linear, not to say I'm going to do an account manager and then I'm going to be head of sales and then head of sales I'm going to do West Africa. Life is not like that. Stuff happens. But just as long as you know it's getting you to the point, it's giving you the skills or the experience that you can then call on, I think it's I think it's fine. But you know, and in this day and age by the way, the traditional okay yeah, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Doesn't happen at all. So I don't know who else wants to. Any more? The only thing I want to add to that is that um, we are all a work in progress. Okay, so you can't you you can have a plan, but then life gives you detours. So you need to take the detours as they come along and enjoy the journey. That's what is most important. We are all a work in progress. Second question, please. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a soft voice or a strong voice? <laughs> I think it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm a graduate computer engineer. What's your name? Sandra. Sandra. Sorry, I'm not. Sorry. Okay. And my question is about um, when mm -hmm. Mrs. Ogunai was talking, she mentioned having to learn online 
um, Google and stuff like that because you can't really afford the time to be in school because technology keeps evolving. I'm a computer engineer and then anytime you search for jobs, you see requirements like CCNA certificate, CCNP and the likes. So if you don't have the time to be in school because technology keeps evolving, how do you, is it okay to learn like personal development and then so I come to you, I need a job, I have knowledge in, I'm a Cisco certified network administrator, not because I wrote the exam but because I learned on my own. Is it? I don't know how to put okay, it, but so then is it okay? Yeah, I get is that you. going to be considered? I get you. So what I meant was I couldn't have left my job. I spent one year in some telco school learning 2G. By the time I would have come back, 3G would have been deployed. But whilst I was working, I did my master's because it was important. I took a law certificate program because I needed to understand how to manage contracts and international law, blah, blah. Okay, when I had to change from engineering into marketing, I had to, I couldn't have done Chartered Institute of Marketing, so I had to find a school in, in the US and go and do a marketing course, find one in France, go and do a marketing course and put that together. So I'm not saying don't take the formal, I mean, when I was doing my national services, when I went to IPMC and did my IT course. So you, you can find a way of doing the right certification to carry you along. But what I meant was, in terms of technology, you have to learn it on the job. Anybody? Okay, wait, let me go to the back and I'll come to you, I promise. Yes. My name is can you stand up so we can see uh, please? My name is Anna Bagloso. About the whole uh, ladies in tough positions and that doesn't really exist like what is it really like because I have been in spaces where we're pushing for ladies in technology I was doing it because maybe I wanted the girls to learn it but I wasn't doing it because I thought there was this huge gap that needs to be filled and stuff I want to understand how real the problem is saying what exactly I'll give you the Ghana, she'll give you the India <laughs> <laughs> That is so real, it's not funny. I mean we have five hundred and something engineers in Vodafone and we've we've managed to grow the female percentage from like eight to ten percent. I think it's fifty nine out of five now yeah fifty nine out and that has been deliberate. We go to the universities, get students who are just in their third year to come and do a program here after national service to recruit them in. It's been very, very deliberate. Even when some of them come in, they find it difficult and, and wonder where am I going, will this work, and I just slip off out of engineering and do something else. The problem is real and you need to really support them to know, look, it's exciting even as you progress and you can have a full career in, in technology as a woman. So is it with just technology? Because I've not seen people comparing the number of men in being nursing to the number of women in other fields as well. So I just want to understand why um, technology seems to be kind of special. But the problem is worse because if you look at generally um, the subjects that she's talking about, you know, the whole science, uh, engineering, mathematics type of um, angle, men somehow boys tend to fall into those subjects so even in school at this level younger primary you need to intentionally educate young ladies that it's okay to choose that they tend to so you find the problem more in that area than in others mm -hmm. having said that there's still few women in very senior positions it's it's a problem across many industries um and it continues to exist so there's still a lot of work to be done but you find it more engineering okay uh, if i can answer you in indian perspective or and i think it's it's almost similar everywhere um, the female percentage in my team might grow from four percentage to 23 percentage but one thing is for sure in our times it was something unique because engineering mean meant as if it has to be hammer it has to be screwdriver it has to be climbing the tower you know those kind of things so your parents used to stop you from you know doing that kind of boyish job you know boy like job uh, so so in indian culture it's like if you're a girl either you become a teacher or at the most you have if you are very intelligent then you can become a doctor but not engineer 
so uh, yeah my level is i became engineer now uh, now uh, now i must tell you with all respect to men around the analytical mind which we want in telecom industry we get more in a lady because we don't look only straight you know see when when a man looks at a female he looks like this but we look like this and he can age all of them right we have got that you you must accept that we are gifted so we don't look at a problem only like this you know we we look at a problem like this so so our our uh, vision is actually wider than than uh, so i have found in my my uh, tenure of course i was i was the first engineer to be recruited in the indian army so that was a different ball game altogether to you know where will the how will this girl do the work kind of stuff but um, in in telecom i have seen that i could motivate them and guide them to the exact destination they they want to and and it's just that the sincerity of the female the girl matters a lot Yeah, so the youngster, they are actually fried rice. Like they want everything. <laughs> so if you get the, they can be brilliant. Yeah. Combination fried rice. Okay. So um, can we go? Yes, I promise to come to you. My God, this is funny. All right. Hi. Hi. I feel very good to be here because I've had a lot of things that are going to help me going forward. Um, my question is, um, I study computer science in school. And in my class, I was um, one of the eight ladies, as compared to eighty guys wow. in the class. And um, constantly, I would have to. What school was it? Sorry, I went to University for Development Studies. I'm not. And I constantly had to like kind of remind the lecturer that I am here. And um, sometimes when there's trouble or we have an issue, and nobody looks my way, I have to like volunteer myself to do it. And, you find out that all the rest of the people, like the guys, they don't really have the answer, but they are scared to ask you, or they feel some type of way about asking you. So I have to make myself available. Some of them feel like um, I'm too loud or I'm too known. Let's put it that way. And right now in my office, I'm the only female in the office, and it's the same thing happening. I just started this job about four months ago, and I've been studying it a little bit. Um, I can walk into the office and there's a problem. No one asks me. I would have to volunteer myself, and it just led me to feel some type of way. Oh. It it because I feel like these people feel you do not know. So sometimes I'd rather keep quiet. I'd rather um, now become a very quiet person at work. I don't volunteer myself anymore. <laughs> I feel like you should see me. Like, you have to understand that I know these things. If not for that, I wouldn't be here. Have you ever dealt with such a situation? And if you were in my position, how would you deal with this? Listen, it's, don't always blame them. It's it's an unconscious bias that they have. I had a guy walk to me um, a few a few years ago and said, Patricia, see, she's going on maternity leave and we can't do this project. I said, hey, what do you want them to do? And then he came to the realization that. He was complaining about something that was not the fault of the lady. I mean, what can she do if she has to, she, she, should she deliver in the office? No, she has to go. And, and you could see that he was sorry for saying that to me. That's how he's, those people who encounter, they don't intend to be mean. That's how they've been raised. You know, your place is not where you are. You are supposed, they've been socialized to think that it's the man's world. You have to be in the kitchen, or you have to be. You don't have to be there to solve the. So they don't have to bring the issue to you. The men have to solve it, you know. And and it's it's a constant fight that we have to go through to, to continue to educate them in in a way to realize that you don't have to distinguish between a man and a woman. It's about how to solve the issue, you know. So don't maybe it's a mindset also that you you think they are not recognizing you. Free yourself of that. Tell yourself you exist, and when they don't ask you, volunteer the answer. At the end, you have solved the problem, and walk away confident. Because if you if you you can't change how I mean these people have been raised for so many I mean it's about 40, 50 years. When are you going to change the way he thinks, what he thinks about a woman? A lot of power lies in your hands on how you project yourself, how you accept, how you tell yourself that 
I exist and I will make a difference. Um, and, and I think there was also something that uh, Agnes said earlier on along the way about kind of standing out and blending in at the same time. So you hang out with them. You've got to do what they like to do in some instances. You've got to have conversations the way they like to have conversations. Um, in my experience, I've realized that guys will talk to you when you sound like a guy. I don't know if that sounds, you know, like, you know, and, and I, in my team, I am the only female now. But they, unless it starts to get offensive, then I remind them that, ah, Charlie, you guys, you have brothers and sisters in Munjai Sa. You know, but even then, I don't chastise them because the moment you chastise them, then they start to think that, wait, hang on a second, you know. But then you've got to, you know, you got to walk in and say, hey, Charlie, guys, Charlie, where do I watch you at? <laughs> no, seriously. And sometimes it's just a tactic and a strategy you you adopt till you win, you know, and such is life. You know, life is about strategy. I think I just want to add a bit to that. Um, because even though I haven't been in engineering or whatever, because I found myself in an organization even out of Ghana for three years, the only female sitting um, with all white males at a, in a boardroom. <laughs> and what you need to do is that. I always remember or put this in my mind that you have to carry the flag for other women mm. because your being in that position is opening the way for the next female. You might not know it, but your interaction in solving the, solving the problems and so on will gain you respect and those guys will look at another female one day differently. And one of the things I'm passionate about, I know that's not the topic for today, is the boy child. So for all of you who are going to have children one day, you also have to cause the change in how you bring up your boys because the African woman is running faster than the male and therefore if the male children continue to be raised as Patricia says the problem will not be solved so you know th there's a lot of things it's a whole journey that we need to continue to do um, to get to where we want to get can I just say just yes point. Um, I think that as women in general we tend to be we tend to overthink things right and I think that, especially when you said computer science, there isn't, you know, computer, our computers, there's no gender there, right? It's like maths, it's, it's like science, they're factual. And sometimes we come into situations with baggage where we walk in highly aware that we're the only female. We walk in thinking the reason why they didn't ask me is because I'm a female. The reason they didn't ask you might be the fact that genuinely they're all friends and you've just come in. That would still happen if you were a female with other females. So sometimes we have to, you, you should shake it off and just do you, be you. No one, and life is hard, no one ever asks you, okay, would you like to solve this issue for me? You know, I mentioned run towards the fire. Put your hand up and say, look, give me the project. I'll work with you, 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 you. You don't have so many, so much baggage in your mind. Go freely. And if you've got the answer, you've got the answer. It's, it's not pink or blue. It's not gender bias. It's you either know it or you're not, or you're hardworking and you're going to figure it out or you're not. You can't control how other people see you. You can only do you. And I think that that's what Patricia said. And I think it's spot on. Because otherwise, you'll get into this very neurotic situation where you're constantly thinking, why are they talking to me? Why are they not? What if it's not wrong? Just go, just go, just go. I'll take two more questions, of which yours is the first. How many more questions do I have? One, two, three, four. Okay, just the last one. All right. <laughs> okay, to add up to what you said, I mean, answering your question, I think sometimes the way you also control the men is very important. If you just do it with respect, yes, you still solve the problem. Thank you. And please, I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can only ask one. Okay. Do you think the Ghanaian curriculum is a way of trapping us? Because it looks like virtually all of you have some sort of education outside, some from the UK, <laughs> America, France, and all. So I 
for me, they are telling I think the Ghanaian curriculum is really a trap in. Same That's about to say it. Everywhere is the same. It's it's you, it's you. It, I listen. I did, I did information systems, information systems and economics for my masters. It's the same. If I did it here, if I did it in, it's the same. Facts are facts. Do, do you understand? If you were saying that actually they're pushing, I think that we talked about a bias, a gender bias, and the fact that. The reason why you're hearing a lot of senior women now talking about STEM, talking about science, technology, maths, is because traditionally women, girls weren't being pushed into those areas. So when you talk about a bias, I think that the bias is there. I don't think the bias is... I really don't. I really don't, personally. Just so you are comfortable with the Ghanaian curriculum, Bishop Bowers, Latin Girl Christian, St. Joseph's Apetia, Presec, Lebon, Tech, Kumasi, University of Ghana, Business School, all of Ghana. So you don't have to go to America in France to be. And then Wesley Girls, University of Ghana, both first to be in second. It works in Ghana. But, but if, I can, if I can tell you something, um, the mind is actually the result of how much you open up to different cultures. Mm -hmm. And I know people who have never set foot in an international, in, outside of Ghana, let alone in other parts of Africa, but their thinking, their thought process, their delivery is impeccable. Why? They read a lot. You know what I mean? They do their traditional TV programs because that's guilty pleasure, but they force themselves... Vodafone, power to you.